so then um, in the recorded lecture I also talked about cardiac output right um, so there are a few um, hopefully uh, in today's review session you guys already started talking about these parameters but um, these cardiovascular equations that kind of illustrate how um, these um, these things um, relate to each other are, are an important thing for you to have just a really good you should just know them by heart and you should understand them you know that cardiac output um, is the volume of blood ejected per by each ventricle per minute um, and uh, it is equal to heart rate times stroke volume right? so heart rate is beats per minute stroke volume is the volume of blood ejected by the ventricles per beat so um, whenever we talk about uh, stroke volume, cardiac output, if you noticed in that cardiac cycle graph, everything was left side of the heart. So it was left ventricular pressure, left atrial pressure, aortic pressure. Okay? So it's really the cardiac cycle from the, from the perspective of the left side of the heart. But everything that's going on on the left side is also going on on the right side. It's just going on at a, at a much lower um, range of pressures. Uh, so the aortic pressure, um, the average aortic um, systolic versus diastolic is 120 over 80, right? 120 versus 80, um, which is what sets the scale there on that cardiac cycle graph. Uh, but the uh, pulmonary artery, which is the destination of the blood getting pumped out of the right side of the heart, might have a pressure range of 4 to 10. Okay? Very, very small changes in pressure compared to pressure changes that we see on the, right, on the left side. Okay? Um, the, I've, said, I've mentioned this before, that the pulmonary circulation is really a very low pressure um, circulatory route because the lungs are really delicate tissue. Okay. So when we talk about cardiac output and stroke volume, we actually do often refer to left-sided cardiac output versus right-sided cardiac output. Now what's healthy and normal is that they should be the same. Right? What comes out of the right side should all go into the left side. And what comes out of the left side should all go out of the right side. So cardiac output on the left and right sides should be equal. Okay. But if you, can, if you think of the heart's primary function is that it is a pump, and its job is to pump blood into the circulatory system, cardiac output truly is the measure of cardiac function. So cardiac output truly is the measure of cardiac function. Okay. So the rest of the circulatory system, all of the blood it gets to deliver oxygen to the tissues has to start with cardiac output. Okay. So it's, it's really um, an incredibly important cardiac uh, performance measure. So cardiac output is controlled by the body by controlling both heart rate and stroke volume. So our, our resting cardiac output um, is normally, uh, in a healthy person, um, more than enough to maintain our metabolic needs at rest. Okay? So resting cardiac output is usually even more than what is necessary to maintain our, our metabolic needs at rest. But when we increase our metabolic demands, when we exercise um, or just increase our physical activity, our cardiac output goes up. Okay. So our heart pumps more blood into the um, circulatory system per minute, depending on how active we are. And so to increase cardiac output, we can do it either by increasing heart rate, or increasing stroke volume, or both. Okay. So 
heart rate and stroke volume are, are controlled independently. And I went through in the lecture about um, how those things are controlled. Okay. And I talked about this special feature of the heart um, with regard to control of stroke volume that the heart has, the heart muscle um, has this sort of unique property that the resting length is actually um, not the length where you produce the greatest contraction. That the more you fill the heart, the more um, stretched those that cardiac muscle gets, and actually the greater contraction, contractility it can generate. So the more you fill the heart, the higher the end diastolic volume, the, the greater the stroke volume. So that relationship between end diastolic volume and stroke volume is this relationship called the Frank Starling um, relationship of the heart. Okay. So by simply increasing end diastolic volume, you will increase contractility and stroke volume. Okay. But under most circumstances where we need to increase cardiac output, it's, b it's being done through increased sympathetic stimulation to our heart, which is going to increase both heart rate and cardiac uh, contractility. Okay. So sympathetic stimulation to the heart is going to increase contractility even greater than what will normally happen with increased end diastolic volume. described in the at-home lecture about flow dynamics, right? Um, that flow is really proportional or equal to a change in pressure over resistance to flow. So change in pressure in, if you look at the flow dynamics equation as, as it relates to circulation, change in pressure um, is equivalent to basically perfusion pressure. So the drop in pressure that we see when we go from arteries to arterioles to capillaries to vein, venules and veins. Okay. And then the resistance to flow is really going to be in the circulatory system proportional to the diameter or the ra radius of the vessels. Okay. The smaller the radius, the greater the resistance. And we know that vessels in our body can change in radius. We can dilate them and increase flow uh, by, by increasing the diameter or constrict them and decrease flow by decreasing the diameter. Okay. And that the relationship between um, resistance to flow and radius is an exponential one. Right? Small increases in radius produce huge drops in resistance and inc huge increases in flow. Okay? And even small um, degrees of constriction, even small um, decreases in radius will increase resistance dramatically and decrease flow. function of arteries, right, that they um, very rapidly transport blood from the heart to organs, and then because they are so distensible that they, um, through stretch on their walls, they sort of um, store the pressure that's generated by um, the ventricles, right, so that when the ventricles are relaxing, the artery um, recoil is actually providing the perfusion pressure. Okay. And then I went through um, the blood pressure um, measurements and the, the how it relates to brachial artery pressure and the different um, corticoff sounds.
any questions about any of that before we then we're going to move on okay about arteries so so we're going to sort of continue our discussion about the um, vascular tree um, and moving from arteries we're going to start to talk about arterioles um, and then capillaries and venules and veins okay um, and then those venules and veins eventually bring blood back to the right side of the heart and the whole thing starts all over again um, so in the arteries, you notice in this slide what we, what we see here um, is the change in pressure that originally starts with the left ventricle. The left ventricle pressure is, is um, changing from uh, nearly zero to a max pressure of 120, right, and going back and forth um, from those two extremes. The pressure in the arteries is also changing um, going from the baseline um, diastolic pressure, the resting pressure, in this case it's close to 80, to the ventricular generated 120. Okay. And um, the mean arterial pressure you can see uh, across the arteries starts to drop as we move across the arterioles, capillaries, and venules and veins. So that mean arterial pressure across the vascular tree is dropping. Okay. And that really is what's providing that perfusion pressure to tissues. Okay. And it's the constant perfusion pressure that's there regardless of whether the heart is in systole or diastole. The arteries are very, very large vessels that very rapidly bring blood from the heart just to um, the organs. And then right before blood enters organs, those vessels um, branch and get smaller and they form vessels called arterioles. So arterioles are located just as blood is entering organs. And those, that's an important placement. Okay. Because it, they really, um, as we'll talk about in a moment, the arterioles are really going to decide how much of cardiac output each organ is going to get. So arterioles have sort of two inc incredibly important um, functions in the cardiovascular system. Because they directly supply organs and because arterioles can constrict or dilate, they variably distribute cardiac output based on the current demands of the organ. So arterioles decide um, what percentage of ca total cardiac output um, any particular organ gets. And that percentage changes depending on the metabolic demands of the organ. Okay. And then arterioles also, again, because they can constrict and dilate, they help regulate arterial blood pressure. Okay. So when we look at arterioles, um, 
the structure of the wall of an arterial is much less complicated than we saw with the arteries. The arteries had really, really thick, um, very elaborate uh, vessel walls. The arterioles have um, a, an interior endothelial lining, just like we saw with arteries. And then they are just covered with sort of sparse, um, smooth muscle. So they are in, have an endothelium and they are covered in smooth muscle. And it's the constriction or contraction of that smooth muscle that can cause vasoconstriction and the relaxation of that smooth muscle that can cause dilation. Okay. Now, the arterioles in our body they all have a normal resting diameter. Okay. And that resting diameter that is um, determined by the normal, what we call arteriolar tone. Okay. And that what we mean by tone is because there's muscle surrounding these vessels, they, um, their diameter is really restricted by how um, sort of the baseline contractility of that smooth muscle. Okay. And that contractility or the tone is determined by just the basic elastic properties of muscle tissue, but also based on the baseline sympathetic activity. Yeah, so the resting diameter of the arterioles is determined by the baseline tone, which is really produced by the basic elastic properties of the muscle and the baseline sympathetic tone or sympathetic input. So if we think about some, think about this tone at rest. So the basic um, muscle tissue properties, that's, that's a constant, right? That's true across um, all people pretty much. When you think about resting sympathetic tone, okay, or resting sympathetic activity, that's highly variable, okay? Generally speaking, People who, for example, um, lead more sedentary lives, they're not um, athletically conditioned in any way, tend to have higher sympathetic tone at rest, right? higher sympathetic activity at rest, compared to people who are um, more active and um, are more conditioned in terms of physical activity. They tend to have lower sympathetic tone at rest and higher um, parasympathetic tone at rest. So what degree of, what diameter these arterioles have at rest is highly variable. And then from that baseline diameter, arterioles can constrict, the um, diameter can get smaller and therefore blood flow can get lower or the vessels can dilate and the, the diameter can get larger and flow can, can increase. Okay. So what controls vasoconstriction and vasodilation? There are two general um, factors that will control uh, constriction and dilation. There's intrinsic or local factors, and then there's extrinsic, which is both um, neuronal and hormonal. Okay. So let's first talk about the local changes, because the local um, factors are incredibly important. Um, 
many local changes can cause dilation or constriction. We've got lots of physical things that can cause dilation and constriction, um, in including things like a change in local temperature. So heating or cooling an area will cause dilation or constriction. Generally, heating an area causes dilation and increased blood flow. Cooling an area will cause constriction and decreased blood flow. This other physical change um, on the slide that, that uh, is described as the myogenic response to stretch. Um, this is a transient change um, where it, when a blood, when the, um, when you get an increase in blood flow to an area and the vessels um, stretch, there's this rebound recoil. Okay. So it's almost like a, um, a short-lived constriction in response to an increase in flow of the area. It's not significant. You can kind of ignore it for now. The most important local changes that will control constriction and dilation are chemical in nature particularly local metabolic changes. So before I talk about local metabolic changes, let me just mention something about histamine that's, that's on that list of chemical changes. Histamine is an inflammatory mediator. It's released during inflammatory responses. It's a very strong vasodilator. We talk about inflammatory responses and pathophysiology, but um, inflammatory responses uh, involve the release not just of histamine, but a whole host of mediators, and um, almost all of them cause vasodilation. Okay. So whenever there is inflammation, you have lots of vasodilation. But in terms of regulating blood flow from moment to moment based on metabolic needs, um, or in order to match metabolic changes, the local mechanism to do that is actually um, that these, there are changes in certain factors that reflect changes in metabolic activity that will directly cause constriction and dilation. Okay. So um, when we talk about these local changes, the part of the vessel that controls this is the endothelium. Okay. So that inner portion of the arterioles, the endothelium, it's not just um, structural. Those endothelial cells play a critical role in the regulation of blood flow. Okay. The endothelium plays a critical role in the regulation of blood flow. Those endothelial cells can sense the local concentration of things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, pH, and free adenosine. Those are the most important ones. Okay. And depending on the levels of those uh, chemical factors, the endothelium can either release an, an, a vasoconstrictor or a vasodilator to act on the smooth muscle. So for example, when metabolic activity of a tissue is low, so metabolic activity of an organ is low, you'll tend to have slightly elevated oxygen levels, slightly reduced CO2, 
the tissue acidity will be low and the free adenosine is low. And adenosine has to do with the breakdown of ATP. When adenosine, adenosine triphosphate is in that form, ATP, right, that energy has not been used yet. But once ATP is broken down and you get free adenosine, that, that's what we're talking about. So when the endothelium senses those levels, okay, it sees the, the metabolic needs of the organ is low, and it releases a, um, a vasoconstrictor called endothelin. And it acts on that smooth muscle and it causes constriction. On the other hand, when the metabolic needs of the organ are high, metabolic activity is high, you'll tend to have relatively low levels of oxygen or, or decrease in oxygen, an increase in CO2, increased acidity and adenosine, and the endothelium releases when it senses this, it releases a vasodilator called nitric oxide. And that dilates the, the vessels. Now nitric oxide, which is actually a gas, before it was identified, okay, it was called endothelial derived relaxing factor. because we knew the endothelium was releasing something, we just didn't, we hadn't identified what it was yet. So endothelial derived relaxing factor, or EDRF, is the same as nitric oxide, if you ever um, read one or the other. Yeah. It's, it's released directly and it's released in small amounts to act locally, yeah. So what you'll find is, for example, um, if you're talking about the, let's say, the cardiac muscle, the parts of the heart that are, that are working the hardest and experiencing um, the greatest change in these factors, um, for example, the um, local release of nitric oxide in the most metabolically active parts of the heart will cause vasodilation of just that area. Yeah. So it, it really helps control the regional distribution of blood flow to, a, to an organ. Yeah. What's enzymes? They're vasoconstrictors and vasodilators. Yeah, they're they're just like any other vasoconstrictor. Yeah, they're they're chemicals that have vasoactive properties that they yeah. Okay. And this local control of blood flow is incredibly important. Okay. Um, and we'll we'll talk about this in patho a lot uh, because one of the things that gets damaged when people have things like high blood pressure um, or diabetes, hyperglycemia, is the endothelium starts to get damaged and it starts to um, lose its ability to regulate the distribution of blood flow, to regulate the um, release of, of nitric oxide or endothelin. And um, that's actually what causes all the circulatory problems that we see with um, with those conditions. So the local control of blood flow through the endothelial regulated um, uh, vasodilation and, and vasoconstriction is incredibly important. So in addition to that, in addition to the local regulation of uh, diameter, arterial or diameter, is the extrinsic control which is done through both the autonomic nervous system and circulating hormones.
So extrinsically, the two arms of the autonomic nervous system can influence um, the arterial or diameter. Sympathetic nerves innervate the entire vascular tree except for um, the capillaries. So sympathetic nervous system has, you know, innervates arteries, innervates arterioles, innervates the veins. The parasympathetic nervous system does not um, innervate, directly innervate the vasculature. Okay. So really in terms of um, extrinsic control of the nervous system, it's really the sympathetic system that when it increases, you tend to get... Um, when sympathetic nerve activity increases, what you tend to get is generalized vasoconstriction. And when sympathetic activity decreases, you tend to get generalized vasodilation. Okay. Now, if you recall um, when we talked about the autonomic nervous system, I mentioned about the distribution of adrenergic receptors. So the adrenergic receptors that respond to norepinephrine and epinephrine include alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2, right? So the alpha-1 receptors on the smooth muscle of the arterioles, when norepinephrine binds to it, you get constriction. Okay. And we see alpha-1 receptors on the arterioles perfusing the visceral organs. The beta-2 receptors have a slight, uh, slightly greater preference for epinephrine than norepinephrine, but they can bind to both. And when they bind to epinephrine or norepinephrine, the beta-2 receptors cause vasodilation. And we find beta-2 receptors on vessels that perfuse skeletal muscle. So when we say that an increase in sympathetic activity in the body causes generalized vasoconstriction, it means that even though some vascular beds are dilating, Overall, the net effect is a vasoconstriction. Okay. But as we'll see in a moment, the fact that norepinephrine and epinephrine causes vasodilation in key vascular beds is very important in terms of during a stress response um, sending blood to sort of high priority areas to respond to a stress, a stressful situation, okay? So the arterioles had two jobs, if you recall. It was to distribute cardiac output and help regulate um, blood pressure. So how does the arteriolar diameter help regulate blood pressure? So if we think about for a minute the flow, um, the flow equation, so flow is equal to a change in pressure over resistance. If we apply this, this equation to the cardiovascular system as a whole and we identify some um, equivalent uh, parameters, so flow across the entire cardiovascular system 
um, is equivalent to cardiac output. Okay. And the change in pressure across the system is equivalent to mean arterial pressure. And the resistance to flow is equivalent to um, total peripheral resistance. Okay. This thing that we're calling total peripheral resistance. Now, total peripheral resistance, it's a new um, term that I'm introducing. It's really the resistance to blood flow across the entire vascular tree. Cardiac output is the flow through the entire vascular tree. Mean arterial pressure is the change in pressure. So if flow equals change in pressure over resistance, then cardiac output equals mean arterial pressure over total peripheral resistance. Okay. Or, in other words, mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. Okay. And the reason why arteriolar, the arterioles help regulate blood pressure is because total peripheral resistance is most influenced by the state of the arterioles, whether they are constricted or dilated. Okay. So sy systemic um, uh, sympathetic activation is high in the body. It causes arterioles in general to constrict, which elevates total peripheral resistance and increases mean arterial pressure. When sympathetic activity is low, arterioles tend to dilate, TPR goes down, and MAP goes down. Okay. So by manipulating vascular resistance, by manipulating the arterioles, we help regulate mean arterial pressure. So this idea that the arterioles also regulate distribution of cardiac output. So the analogy here is that because arterioles sit between arteries and organs, and organ perfusion, they really um, end up being sort of the, the, gate, the gates to um, perfusion of the organ. So they determine, so if the, the main line are the arteries and then the spouts um, uh, branching off of them are the arterioles and the beakers um, represent blood flow to the organs, the, whether arterioles are constricted or dilated determines whether organs get um, moderate flow, large flow, minimal flow, okay? and that's going to be determined by um, some systemic issues and also the metabolic activity of the organ. So in this slide, which it's one of my favorite slides because it illustrates so much, it says so much in just a picture. Okay? So what we, in this slide what we're looking at is actually um, the distribution, the total cardiac output and distribution of cardiac output at rest versus during moderate exercise. Okay. So on the left side is the resting state. So at rest, this person, this average person, has a total cardiac output of about 5,000 milliliters per minute or five liters per minute, okay? So every minute, five liters of blood is getting pumped into the circulatory system, okay? That's at rest. That, if you think about it, is astounding. The human body only has about a little over five liters of blood total. So at rest, your heart pumps your entire blood volume every minute. And then from that, different 
vascular beds or different organs, organ systems, are receiving a different percentage of total cardiac, out, uh, of total cardiac output. Okay. So at rest, your kidneys are getting 20%. Right? They're tiny little, um, tiny little organs, but they're getting 20% because their job is to filter the blood. Right? The digestive tract in the liver is getting 27% at rest. The brain gets a nice healthy 13%, right? Skeletal muscle 15 and so forth. Now, compare that to moderate exercise. We're not talking about maximal exercise, just moderate exercise. Enough to get your heart flowing, or your heart pumping rather. The first thing to notice is that this bar graph has increased in size dramatically. Okay. So total cardiac output went from 5,000 at rest to 12.5 thousand. So 12 and a half liters. It's more than doubled. Okay. Now your heart is pumping over twice your blood volume per minute. Okay? And that has been accomplished. How is how does how was that accomplished? How how all of a sudden is the heart um, how did it over double the cardiac output? Increase in heart rate and stroke volume. Right? Heart rate went up and stroke volume went up. So you're, you're pumping more blood per heartbeat and more beats per minute, okay? So total cardiac output went up, which means that all your organ systems are gonna get more flow, but we also start to shuffle the distribution of blood to the different <laughs> organ systems. So the digestive system is the per so over here what we're looking at in black is the percentage change in blood flow okay did it go up did it go down did it change at all so the digestive system is getting 50 percent less blood during exercise than it is at rest that makes sense right you're not in rest and digest anymore you're in fight or flight so blood flow gets diverted away from the, the digestive tract. The kidneys, 45% less. The brain, no change, right? The arterioles that perfuse the brain do not constrict, right? They do not reduce, you never are in the position where you're reducing blood flow to the brain. The brain needs sort of a given amount of blood and it takes it regardless of the situation. Okay. Bone, 30% less blood flow. Now, who got more blood flow? The heart, 367% increase. Obviously, the heart is working a lot harder. It needs more blood. Skin. 370% increase. What do you think that's about? Sweating. Sweating and body heat, right? We need to dissipate, we need to maintain our, our we don't, we don't want to have our core body temperature rise, so we need to dissipate heat. Okay, so that's what that's about. And then look at skeletal muscle, increased by a thousand percent. Okay, so most of that increase in total cardiac output is actually going to skeletal muscle. Now, why is skeletal muscle increasing? There's a lot of answers to that. Number one, it's the nature of um, the distribution of receptors, right? So we've got those beta-2 receptors on the vasculature of the um, blood vessels that uh, perfuse the skeletal muscle. So when our sympathetic nervous system kicks in, those vessels dilate, 
right? And then on top of that, when we're exercising, the most metabolically active tissue is our skeletal muscle. So locally, you get all of this local vasodilation. Okay. And if you are um, cycling, for example, if that's what the moderate exercise is, your lower body skeletal muscle in your lower body is going to be receiving a lot more blood flow than your upper body because it's working harder. Okay. If you're swimming, it's going to be your whole body because you're using all of your your um, muscle groups. Okay, so with a change in physical activity, we're getting a change in total blood flow through the through the body, total cardiac output, and then we also are getting a a change in the distribution of blood flow um, based on both the um, receptor distribution. And also based on on metabolic activity regionally. Okay. And it's all mediated to those are the arterioles. The arterioles are what's <coughs> controlling the distribution. Okay. So let me take a, a five minute oh wait a minute, actually let me finish this one thing and then we'll take a little bit of a break. Um, so Extrinsic control, um, I told you, was uh, both through the autonomic nervous system and also through um, circulating hormones. So the hormones that are relevant for um, arterial or control of the arterioles include um, epinephrine, which was the hormonal arm of the sympathetic nervous system, um, and also some other um, vasoactive hormones. And as I mentioned, the epinephrine has a little more preference for beta-2 receptors than, than alpha-1 receptors. Um, and norepinephrine has a little more uh, preference for alpha-1 versus the beta. Okay. There are other hormones that also um, can cause constriction. Two hormones that we talk a lot about in the renal system, vasopressin, also known as um, antidiuretic hormone and angiotensin II. They are involved in the regulation of um, total body water and plasma volume, and they are both, both vasoconstrictors. So depending on the, the um, levels of vasopressin and angiotensin II, you can also have um, constriction through, through those hormones and a, and a um, influence over blood pressure because of that. So moving down the vascular tree, um, past the arterioles, which control blood flow to um, different organs, we've got um, the capillaries. And the capillaries are the sites for all exchange between um, the blood and tissues. Now capillaries are very tiny vessels they are highly adapted for diffusion because the, the uh, mechanism of transport for the exchange between blood and tissues by far ma the majority of the time is simple diffusion. Um, so it's highly adapted for diffusion. Things like um, diffusion distance is highly minimized. So um, every cell in our body is um, is very, very close to a capillary. Um, and if, if the cellularity of a tissue increases, um, like when we, or the cells get bigger or the tissue increases, um, the capillary density will tend to also increase proportionately. Um, the thickness of the diffusion barrier is greatly minimized. As we'll see, um, capillaries are very small vessels, very thin vessels, um, and it creates a very thin diffusion barrier. And then there is a tremendous surface area in the capillary beds available for diffusion. Okay. Um, and the velocity of blood movement through the capillary is slow. 
So red blood cells move through capillaries um, more slowly than they do through arteries and arterioles and veins. Okay. And this um, slowing down increases the opportunity for diffusion. So when we look at um, the vascular tree in general, um, it has this branched structure that we've seen before that's a very <coughs> common structure um, in our body where vessels, um, every time they branch, the subsequent vessels get smaller. So with every branching, the vessels get smaller and smaller and smaller. So the capillary beds really represent the smallest vessels of our vascular tree. Okay. Um, and they actually surround tissue beds and um, allow for exchange with, um, with the tissue. Blood then drains out of capillary beds into larger vessels that we call venules, which drain into even larger vessels called veins. So if we look at the cross-sectional area of the vessels moving from arteries to arterioles to capillaries, venules, and veins, what we see is that in once we get to the capillaries, there is this tremendous increase in cross-sectional area. Okay. Now that increase in cross-sectional area is what causes the velocity of blood flow <coughs> to, to decrease so much. Okay. Now, the analogy that's often used is if you can imagine um, a river that flows into a gin gin I was about to say ginormous, that's not a word, um, a gigantic uh, lake, right? A river that flows into a gigantic lake that then flows into another river. Okay? So when you look at the movement of the water through the river, the water looks like it's moving fast. Right? And then when you look at the water moving through the lake, it looks like actually the lake might appear still. Right? And then if you look at the water moving through the, the second river, again it looks fast. So because the water is occupying a much greater cross-sectional area, it slows down. But the overall flow rate is still the same. Milliliters per minute, movement milliliters per minute stays the same. Okay. So this huge cross-sectional area allows for this um, decrease in velocity and, and maximization of, of diffusion. The capillary beds, once we get down to the capillary level, what we basically just have is an endothelium with, n with nothing, um, nothing else. Okay. And these vessels are small. The diameter of a capillary is actually slightly less than the diameter of a red blood cell. Okay. Yeah, so the diameter of a capillary is slightly smaller than the diameter of a red blood cell, which means that red blood cells often have to kind of squeeze through capillaries, which, of course, puts the inside of that red blood cell very close to the wall of the capillary, right? And inside that, inside that red blood cell is where all the oxygen is, right? Bound to hemoglobin. So capillaries are very, very tiny and they are just um, an endothelial lining. And in between the endothelial cells, you have these gaps that we refer to as pores. And these endothelial pores allow for the free movement of fluid. It allows for the movement of things like um, electrolytes, 
So small polar substances can freely move through those pores. What can't get through those pores are plasma proteins like albumin, red blood cells, white blood cells, So the pores are very important in maximizing this um, exchange through diffusion. So the movement of certain things, things that are lipid soluble can get out of the capillary in any way they want. They can get through the pores, they can diffuse across the endothelial cell, <coughs> right? So lipid soluble substances have, have no problem getting across. Um, water soluble substances that are small can diffuse um, through those pores. Larger water soluble substances like um, proteins that we do want to get out of the um, capillary will tend to move through by um, active transport through vesicular transport. But plasma proteins, circulating plasma proteins like albumin, stay inside the, in the blood. They don't leave. Okay. And like I said, the movement is governed through simple diffusion. So that means that wherever oxygen is high, excuse me, wherever oxygen is low, that's the direction of oxygen flow. Wherever carbon dioxide is low, that's the direction of carbon dioxide flow. Okay? So in, in the tissues, oxygen levels are going to be lower, so that it moves into the tissues. Carbon dioxide is going to be higher, so it moves out of the tissues. The sodium, uh, potassium, glucose amino acids are going to move down their gradients. Okay? So all of these nutrients and vital um, gases are going to be delivered based on their concentration gradients. Okay. Now, in addition to um, the movement of these substances, <coughs> there is a well, let me let me <coughs> talk about the bless you. Let me talk about this first. So these capillary beds are sitting between arterioles and venules. Okay? And here we see um, at the top we've got an arteriole, at the bottom we've got a venule, and in the middle we've got a capillary bed. And what you don't see is the tissue that this capillary bed is running through. Now, in addition to the tiny capillaries, what we also have um, dispersed among the capillary beds are slightly larger vessels called meta arterioles. Now these meta arterioles are fast freeway like vessels that allow for blood to quickly go from the arterioles into the venules. Now, generally speaking, blood is either moving through the capillary bed, pref preferably, or it's moving through these meta-arterioles, preferably. Okay. Now, what determines physically whether blood is moving through the capillaries or through the meta-arterioles are these um, regions where we've got smooth muscle called the precapillary sphincter. It's collections of smooth muscle that control the perfusion through capillary beds. It's these regions of smooth muscle that control the perfusion through capillary beds.
when the precapillary sphincters are constricted, blood moves through the metaarterioles. When the precapillary beds are relaxed, blood flows through the capillaries. Constriction or relaxation of the precapillary sphincters is controlled entirely through local metabolic um, needs. So high metabolic activity, right, you get that change in, in oxygen, the low oxygen, high carbon dioxide, high acidity, high adenosine, right? high metabolic activity, that tends to relax the precapillary sphincters and blood flows to the capillary beds. And you get maximal delivery of oxygen and glucose and everything else to tissue. But when blood is not, oh, excuse me, when metabolic activity of the tissue is low and the oxygen levels get a little high, carbon dioxide is low, acidity is low, um, adenosine is low, those precapillary sphincters constrict and blood flows through the metaarterioles. Because it doesn't really need it exactly, and and the the point of it is that if blood is not flowing to one place because it doesn't need it, it's getting shunted to another place that does need it. That's kind of the the whole point. So those precapillary sphincters really help control the degree to which capillary beds are, are being perfused. So that blood, it, it's sort of controlling the regional distribution of blood flow at an even deeper level than the arterioles were. Okay. okay. Now, there's another exchange that's happening at the capillaries that's incredibly important for us to understand. And this is, um, something called capillary bulk flow. And capillary bulk flow refers to the distribution of fluid across the capillaries. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, there is some. Yeah, I mean, the meta arterials, you do have exchange. You just have a smaller surface area, so you have less exchange. Yeah. Yeah, the composition of the meta arterioles is identical to the to the capillaries, so it's also just naked endothelium, but it's it's a um, they're larger, so you have less opportunity for exchange. It's a good question. Okay. So what, what is also happening at the capillaries, as I mentioned, is something called capillary bulk flow. Now this is the distribution or the, the, yeah, the distribution of fluid across the capillaries um, that is entirely passively controlled, so it's, com it's a completely passive process. But the process of capillary bulk flow is it happens throughout the body and it helps to um, distribute extracellular fluid between the vascular compartment and the interstitial compartment. Okay. So it helps distribute extracellular fluid between the plasma and the interstitial space. And the idea is 
um, that by doing that, by regulating the distribution of extracellular fluid, it actually contributes in a small way to the regulation of blood pressure. Okay. Because if, for example, you happen to be um, in a state where your blood volume is expanded, some of that blood volume will move out of the vascular space and into the interstitial space, okay. sort of buffering any increase in blood pressure. And the same if you have blood volume that's reduced, some of the interstitial fluid will move into the vascular space, again, to sort of buffer any drop in blood pressure. What's that? Yeah, so if, if, for example, you have a blood volume expanded state, um, some of that blood volume will actually move out of the blood vessels and into the interstitial space so that the rise in blood pressure is blunted, right? And if you lose blood volume, some of the interstitial fluid will come in to the blood vessel. Okay. So... Do you have a question? Okay. So the control of this, as I said, is completely passive. Um, and uh, this, this concept is incredibly important because um, we, we come back to this concept a lot, uh, both in this class and, and um, in patho next uh, next semester. So capillary bulk, bulk pressure, excuse me, capillary bulk flow um, is a result of passive forces acting both inside of the blood vessels and outside of the blood vessels. Okay. It's a net effect of pressures um, uh, acting both inside and outside of the capillary. So when capillary bulk flow movement is um, causes fluid to move out of the capillary we refer to that as ultrafiltration and when the pressures cause fluid to move into the capillaries we call that reabsorption and so the so this is the tissue these weird little shapes are meant to, to um, illustrate the tissue. In between the blood vessels and the tissue is interstitial space. Okay? And the movement of fluid out of the capillary is ultrafiltration. Into the capillary is reabsorption. So these passive pressures that determine the direction of bulk flow, <coughs> there's two types of pressure and those two types of pressures are found both inside and outside of the blood vessel. Okay. So the two types of pressures are hydrostatic pressures and oncotic pressures. Okay. Now a hydrostatic pressure, hydro meaning water, right? Hydrostatic pressures are pushing pressures Whenever water is in a container, it pushes against the, that container. Okay. So it's a pushing pressure of water against its container. An oncotic pressure is a pulling pressure. It's basically osmotic. And it's caused by proteins that can't leave a membrane pulling fluid in. Okay. So oncotic pressures are pulling pressure caused by proteins that can't get out of a membrane. They pull fluid in. So we have both pressures are present inside of the blood vessel and out of the blood vessel. So inside of the blood vessel, 
the hydrostatic pressure, the pushing pressure, is given a very special name. It's called capillary blood pressure. Okay. So the pushing pressure coming from inside of the capillary is called capillary blood pressure. Now, a pushing pressure from inside of the capillary, will that favor ultrafiltration or reabsorption? Exactly. It will favor ultrafiltration. Okay. The oncotic pressure coming from inside of the capillary, <coughs> called capillary oncotic pressure, or plasma oncotic pressure, okay, caused by plasma proteins, especially albumin, that can't get out of the blood vessel. So that's a pulling pressure coming from inside of the capillary. And what does that promote? Reabsorption. Okay. So inside the blood vessel, we've got capillary blood pressure promoting ultrafiltration and capillary oncotic pressure promoting reabsorption. Now, on the interstitial side, because there's fluid in the interstitial space, it exerts a pushing pressure. So interstitial hydrostatic pressure, what is that going to favor? Reabsorption, right? It's a pushing pressure coming from the interstitial space, and it's going to tend to favor reabsorption. Now, interstitial oncotic pressure is actually a theoretical pressure. Because should we find any plasma proteins in the interstitial space? No. Okay. So normally we wouldn't find um, plasma proteins in the interstitial space. If there are any breaks in the capillary wall during an inflammatory response, we actually, um, albumin escapes out of the capillary. So it's, it's, it's a pressure because um, under certain circumstances we can find albumin in the interstitial space, but under normal circumstances we don't. But if it's there, it's a pulling pressure coming from the interstitial space, which would favor what? Ultrafiltration. Ultrafiltration. Okay. So those are the four pressures. Now. You can tell, you know, so they're, they're pointing in different directions. So normally, like I said, under normal circumstances, interstitial oncotic pressure nearly zero, right? So interstitial oncotic zero is, is uh, oncotic pressure is nearly zero. Interstitial hydrostatic pressure and, in, and, ca uh, and capillary oncotic pressure are usually constant, right? But capillary blood pressure is not so constant. It depends on how much blood is flowing through the capillary. Okay, so number four we're throwing out because it's nearly zero. Number two and three are constant no matter what's going on but capillary blood pressure changes depending on how much blood is moving through the capillary okay. so two and three capillary oncotic pressure we said pulling pressure inside the capillary favored what reabsorption, and then the pushing pressure in the interstitial space, interstitial hydrostatic pressure, promotes what? Also reabsorption. So two and three promote reabsorption. And capillary blood pressure promoted what? Ultrafiltration. So 
whether we have ultrafiltration or reabsorption is entirely dependent on capillary blood pressure. Okay? Entirely dependent on capillary blood pressure. So you can imagine, like I said, if you've got significant increase in blood volume, that's going to increase capillary blood pressure, and you'll get a net ultrafiltration. It'll be larger than two and three, and you'll get ultrafiltration. If you have a reduced um, blood volume, capillary blood pressure is going to be lower. One is going to be less than two and three, and you'll get a net reabsorption. Right? And then within capillary beds, depending on whether blood is moving through the metarterial or the capillary, right, is going to determine whether capillary blood pressure is greater, great, great enough to overcome two and three. That makes sense? So in patho, when we talk about, um, we'll talk about things like edema, Right, so we know like edema is a accumulation of fluid in interstitial space. It's edema is caused by an imbalance of these these uh, pressures. Right, so when someone has um, when someone is in a starvation state or um, damaged liver function, you get a drop in albumin. Right, the liver produces albumin and then they don't. They don't have as much. When albumin goes down, what pressure is affected? Yeah, which oncotic? Yes, capillary oncotic pressure or plasma oncotic pressure. And when that pressure that promotes reabsorption goes down, you get net ultrafiltration and fluid accumulates in the interstitial space. So this is a, an, a very important um, concept, especially in terms of understanding um, the distribution of extracellular fluid. If you've ever um, dealt with um, liver patients, you, you find that they have this paradoxical thing where they look really waterlogged, right? They've got a lot of fluid, a um, lot of pitting edema, they've got ascites, but their blood pressure is like incredibly low because they've got the, the volume, they just can't keep it in their blood vessels because they don't have enough albumin, right? So all their blood volume tends to leak out into their interstitial space. Okay. So this is this concept of capillary bulk flow um, and the, the distribution of extracellular fluid between the vasculature and the interstitial space. I will. I, I meant to post it before, but I promised to post it um, tonight. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Yep. Okay. So moving from capillaries to the veins. So we're the end is in sight, right? We're at the, the last vessels. Um, so the veins are also large vessels. Um, and the, the vessel walls of veins have um, also an interior endothelial lining, but they have very little smooth muscle. Okay. So veins are highly compliant vessels, okay. meaning that when you, when blood enters veins, veins readily expand and accommodate that blood. Okay. Unlike arteries, the arteries sort of resist that expansion. There's this recoil, right? But with veins, there's really very little recoil. They're very compliant vessels. So because of that, they are sometimes referred to as capacitance vessels, meaning that they have a large capacity to hold blood, 
And because of that, they are also sometimes referred to as sort of a blood reservoir, meaning that they can hold a large um, proportion of our blood volume. It's not as though the blood is stagnant, it is moving, it's just moving slowly. Okay. So at any given time, if you looked at how much of your total blood volume is in any given vessel, you can see that at rest, 64% um, or so of your blood volume is actually in systemic veins. Okay. So again, the idea of it being a blood reservoir means that it's there when you need it. So when we are in times of stress, like in moderate exercise, and our sympathetic activity increases, among other things, we constrict our veins. Okay. And vasoconstriction of veins is what it actually does is reduce the compliance of those veins. Okay. The veins return to their original diameter and they tend to expand less readily. So their capacity goes down. Okay. And if the veins if the capacity of the veins go down, then where does that blood, where's that blood force to go? Back to the heart. What's that? That's right. It's, it's forced to return to the heart, so what we call venous return, or venous return of blood to the heart will increase, which will directly increase end diastolic volume and ventricular filling. Okay. So our veins are these high capacity vessels that at rest are very compliant and under sympathetic stimulation they decrease their compliance and their capacity which increases venous return and ventricular filling. Well, they have smooth muscle. They have smooth muscle, just not as much as the arteries did or the arterioles did. So this, their smooth muscle, their smooth muscle when they constrict, it actually just returns the vessel to its baseline diameter. It doesn't, it doesn't constrict it below that. It just reduces its tendency to sort of relax and, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. So venous of, uh, return of blood to the heart is incredibly important in um, end diastolic volume and therefore in stroke volume. So. Um, So this idea of, of um, the veins being highly compliant and venous return of blood to the heart being important in, in ventricular filling and stroke volume, um, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge because much of our veins, especially um, our larger capacity veins, are actually located in our lower extremities in the lower part of our body. So in most of the time, <coughs> blood flow back to the heart through the veins is moving against the flow of gravity. So venous return of blood to the heart um, is, there are several um, things that help promote and maintain venous return of blood to the heart okay, because of this challenge of high capacity, capacity compliance veins um, and the um, challenge of gravity. Okay. So factors that help influence venous return, um, I'm going to talk about them in a second, but they include things like that sympathetic vasoconstriction, 
skeletal muscle activity, which I'll explain in a minute, um, the fact that veins have valves and encourage one-way flow of blood, the um, because of the, the nature of our respiratory system, we've got um, a pressure difference in our thoracic cavity where the heart is located compared to the abdominal cavity. And that cardiac suction that I was referring to um, when we went over the cardiac cycle graph. Okay. So, um, so I, I described um, sympathetic vasoconstriction before. So let me talk about skeletal muscle activity. So the the large veins and lower lower um, extremities, especially the ones um, that move through the lower and upper parts of the leg, those veins, especially the largest veins, those deep veins that are very, very big, actually move through the largest muscle groups in our lower extremity. Okay. They move through those muscle groups because the contraction of those muscles actually help milk the blood up towards the heart. Okay. So the contraction of those skeletal muscle groups actually help squeeze and milk the blood up the veins and back to the heart. And you can really see, um, you can really see this, especially when you think about um, situations where people are forced to stand motionless for long periods of time. It's very common under those circumstances for people to get what's called orthostatic hypotension, which is um, a uh, drop in blood pressure because of body position. Um, so very not so uncommon scenario. You think about um, in the military, people standing at attention for long periods of time, very motionless. The, um, there's less skeletal muscle activity, so the movement of blood back to the heart actually decreases. Right? So you have less venous return, less um, end diastolic volume, decreased cardiac output, decreased blood pressure. Okay? And that hypotension can get so bad that you get syncope where somebody faints because they've been standing so long that their blood pressure has dropped. Right? And it's actually um, like an old military trick that you sort of flex your muscles silently um, while you're standing at attention to, to help increase that blood flow back to your heart. Or you think about um, all the grooms that are on uh, America's Funniest Home Videos, right? Where they're standing at the altar for hours and hours waiting for their bride and they just, they crash over. That's probably more than just the orthostatic hypotension. But the contraction of skeletal muscle and its ability to milk blood back up to the heart is actually, um, it's only effective because veins have valves. Okay? Because along, especially these larger, actually all veins, but especially these larger veins, um, at given intervals of length, you have these one-way valves that help blood move towards the heart so that when the muscle contracts, right, blood is actually going to be, going to tend to move away from the point of contraction, but it's going to be funneled in the right direction, quote unquote, because it's not actually going to be, not going to be allowed to move in the wrong direction. Okay. Towards the heart, yeah. 
And if you think about um, um, varicose veins, varicose veins that are very, um, let's say, superficial varicose veins of the of the legs that are very um, uh, tortuous and enlarged and visible. What varicose veins really are are veins where the valves have failed and um, the vein expands and becomes sort of uh, enlarged and what we call tortuous. Okay, so the movement through that vein gets slow and it can be painful right, for those reasons. But these valves really help um, that movement of blood towards the heart. Okay. Um, so if you can move past the leg warmers and the, the leopard print <laughs> leotard uh, on this slide. Um, what this is supposed to be illustrating is the, um, the influence of the sub-atmospheric thoracic pressure on venous return. So when blood is moving from the uh, lower limbs into the abdominal cavity towards the thoracic cavity back to the heart, the pressure in the lower half of the body is basically atmospheric while the pressure in the thoracic cavity is about five millimeters of mercury less than atmospheric pressure. So it's this negative pressure that sort of enhances um, blood movement towards the heart. Throughout the whole respiratory cycle. And then that cardiac suction that I mentioned in the cardiac cycle graph, that idea that as the heart is contracting, as those ventricles are emptying, the atria are getting pulled and expanded, which sort of sucks blood into the atria. Okay. So the, the heart sort of plays a role in its own filling um, through that cardiac suction. And that helps um, enhance venous return. So the the pressure, the blood pressure across the vascular tree, um, as you as you saw, the absolute pressure. Um, change depending on where along the vascular tree you, you were. And if we looked at um, the arteries and the arterioles, what we saw um, is a sort of change in pressure with the cardiac cycle. We saw a diastolic versus a systolic um, uh, change in pressure. And then once you got past the arterioles, that, that systolic, diastolic change um, was lost. But across the entire vascular tree, mean arterial pressure um, allowed for a constant perfusion pressure no matter what stage the heart is in. Okay? So mean arterial pressure is the main driving force um, supplying blood to tissues. Perfusion pressure. Whether the heart is in systole or diastole, and so because of that, mean arterial pressure is highly regulated by the body. Okay. It has to be has to be within a healthy range to maintain perfusion to tissues. If it's too low, you get inadequate perfusion. But if it's too high, you increase the workload on the heart, which causes pathology, and you damage small blood vessels if blood pressure is too high, which causes pathology. Okay. So controlling mean arterial pressure 
is going to be done by controlling all the things that determine mean arterial pressure. So MAP is equal to cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. Right. So all the things that determine cardiac output, all the things that determine total peripheral resistance are all things that are going to affect mean arterial pressure. So big crazy slide, but this is basically the equations, right? So mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. Okay. Cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. Total peripheral resistance is highly dependent on the status of the arterioles, right? Arteriolar radius. And the other thing that, that uh, contributes to total peripheral resistance is the viscosity of blood. Now the viscosity is really going to be about the ratio of red blood cells to plasma, so hematocrit essentially. So everything below this that line, all of the things below that, are all things that are going to affect heart rate, stroke volume, arterial radius, blood viscosity, and therefore affect mean arterial pressure. Okay? So the, the degree of parasympathetic activity affects heart rate, cardiac output, and MAP the degree of sympathetic activity is going to affect both heart rate and stroke volume and it's going to affect arteriolar radius. Right? And then some of these things actually um, salt and water balance, vasopressin, angiotensin 2, these things we're actually going to talk about in the in the renal system, okay? But con the mechanisms for controlling blood pressure, there are two facets to controlling blood pressure. There's short-term control of blood pressure and long-term control of blood pressure, okay? Short-term control and long-term control. Now, the short-term control of blood pressure is done by controlling, and I'm just going to say this now and I'm going to explain it in a second. The short-term control of blood pressure is done through the control of heart rate, stroke volume, and arteriolar radius. So short-term control of blood pressure from moment to moment is really done by adjusting heart rate, stroke volume, and arteriolar radius, level of constriction. Okay. Long-term control of blood pressure is done by controlling blood volume. Long term is done by controlling blood volume, which is actually the job of the renal system. So let's let's dive a little bit more into this short term regulation. Okay. Short term regulation of blood pressure is done through a reflex that we refer to as the baroreflex or the baroreceptor reflex. A baroreceptor is a pressure sensor. It's some sensor or, or um, sensory nerve ending that 
can measure the pressure in a blood vessel. Now, we have baroreceptors, pressure receptors, in two key places. We have a baroreceptor that's associated with the aortic arch and baroreceptors that are associated with the carotid sinus. Okay. What other sensors did we talk about in those two locations? Chemoreceptors, right? The same two places we had chemoreceptors. Okay. And similar to the chemoreceptors, these baroreceptors, the aortic arch baroreceptors, are telling the brain about the blood pressure to the entire circulatory system. While the carotid sinus baroreceptors are informing the brain about the blood pressure perfusing the brain, right? the blood vessels perfusing the brain. Now, when we talk about um, when we talk about short-term regulation of blood pressure, we're talking about really moment-to-moment -moment changes in blood pressure that are predominantly caused by changes in body position. Okay. So, when we talk about short-term regulation of blood pressure. We're really talking mostly about these moment-to-moment -moment changes in blood pressure that can um, happen as a result of a change in body position. Okay. When, you, when your body is in a, um, a prone or a supine position, basically when you're flat and horizontal, it's easier to perfuse your brain than when you're standing upright or sitting upright. Okay. It takes a lower heart rate, a lower stroke volume, and a lower arteriolar diameter to perfuse your brain when you're lying flat than when you're upright, whether standing upright or sitting upright. So the baroreflex or baroreceptor reflex helps you make adjustments to maintain adequate perfusion pressure to your brain when your body changes position. So if we look at the way these baroreceptors communicate with the brain. So let's say that your blood pressure is within your normal range. Okay? Your normal is 120 over 80. The baroreceptors have a given firing rate. So what we're looking at here is actually the electrical activity of these baroreceptors and each little mark is an action potential. So they're firing a particular number of fi um, action potentials per minute. They have given firing rate. If your blood pressure increases, the firing rate goes up. Right? Tells the brain blood pressure has increased. If your blood pressure decreases, firing rate goes down. Tells your brain blood pressure went down. Now, the reason why these, this baroreceptor reflex, I'm, I'm kind of um, emphasizing the short-term idea, is that these baroreceptors adapt to any sustained change in blood pressure. So let's say your blood pressure goes up, 
and it stays up. Something's wrong and you can't, the, the body can't bring it back down. At the onset of the change, the baroreceptors increase their firing rate. But once blood pressure stays up for more than two minutes, these baroreceptors go back to the normal firing rate, even at this high blood pressure. They've adapted to the change. Okay. Because they are only responsible for the onset of changes. They do not remember what blood pressure is supposed to be in a long-term way. They only respond to the onset of the change. And so how do they respond to the onset of the change? They respond through activation of the autonomic nervous system, whether it's parasympathetic or sympathetic. And by changing, as I said, heart rate, stroke volume, vasoconstriction. So, let me go to this, the next slide. So let's say you get an increase in blood pressure the onset of an increase in blood pressure. Okay. The baroreflex kicks in to try to bring blood pressure back down. How does it do that? It increases parasympathetic stimulation to the body, decreases sympathetic stimulation. Okay. The increase in parasympathetic stimulation decreases heart rate, which decreases cardiac output help bring blood pressure back down to normal. The decrease in sympathetic stimulation also helps decrease heart rate, decrease contractility and stroke volume, decrease cardiac output blood pressure. Decrease sym sympathetic stimulation to the arterioles, decreases vasoconstriction, decreases TPR and blood pressure, decreased sympathetic stimulation to the veins, decreased vasoconstriction, decreased venous return, less stroke volume, lower cardiac output, decreased blood pressure. All of these things help bring blood pressure back down to the reference range. But if it can't, if it doesn't for some reason, if blood pressure increased for reasons that this system can't correct for, and blood pressure remains high, the baroreflex turns off and adapts to this new normal. And now it's the responsibility of the long-term system to correct for that blood pressure. Okay. And the long-term system changes blood volume to control blood pressure. Okay. But that system is slow. It takes hours to days for that system to kick in. But it will kick in and it will correct the blood pressure very, very well. Okay. And that system, as I said, the, that control of blood volume, plasma volume, is uh, the job of the renal system. And we will talk about that at length in the renal system when we get to that system. Okay.